All right, I'm uh, Greg Abendahl. I'm originally from Southern Illinois, but I've been here at Kansas State now about 10 years. I work mainly with uh, farm financial data from the KFMA program. So I'm gonna talk about the fuel and fertilizer perspective as it relates to kind of US farmers, because as you might realize, these are two big expenses for most farmers, especially fertilizer these days. It's the second biggest category. So what happens in Russia and Ukraine is very important to uh, farmers here in the US because it greatly affects what we could be paying for prices going forward. All right, first I'll talk about oil, gas, and diesel. Um, I use this background slide, this is kind of a bit of an aside, but this International 826, the gold colored one, this was kind of the tractor I cut my teeth on when I was a grade school student growing up driving this tractor. It's gold because it was actually a demonstrator tractor. It was supposed to be used for one year. I think we had this on our farm probably for about seven or eight years. So a nice tractor, I had some good and bad experiences with it. The bad thing is I probably can't hear near as well because of this particular tractor. But anyway, it was a good tractor to drive. All right, well, what's been happening on the oil side? Well, um, when, the, when the war first started, there was a big concern among traders that there was not gonna be a good supply of oil because oil is a major export from Russia as long with most of the fertilizer products. So um, uh, traders were worried about that we weren't gonna have enough oil coming out of Russia. Russia is really probably the second or third biggest or maybe even the biggest exporter of oil in the world behind the U.S. and maybe Saudi Arabia. They're all three pretty close there. So, But surprisingly, though, uh, oil production out of Russia really hasn't dropped off very much, maybe just a tad. That's probably a lot more than what traders had first thought. You know, there's been a series of tariffs and other restrictions. Uh, the latest thing by the EU is they're trying to cap the price of the oil coming out of Russia. But really, oil is a fungible commodity. And as we have learned in the past, anytime a country tries to do tariffs on a commodity that's fungible, there are ways around that. Just imagine uh, trying to make a dam with water and then stop the flow. The water is gonna find some other way to get there. It may not be the most efficient route, but it will get there eventually. And we're seeing the same thing happen with the oil. So we're seeing oil actually come out of Russia. I, it may not be going the ways it used to. Um, yeah, as you know, uh, Russia and China share the like the sixth largest international border in the world here. So there's always that route. Uh, Russia has definitely been shipping a lot more oil to India as well here. So the oil is getting out. Um, and again, with the price caps that the EU is trying to put on, that's not going to work very well either here. So Russia really is facing the, the market price. So, you know, really what the most effective thing against Russia at the moment really hasn't been the tariffs. It's the fact that the oil price is actually going down. So that, that's hurting their ability to fund the war just because oil is so much lower than really what it was when, the, when this whole conflict started. And this graph here shows you what, what's been happening with the oil price. So we, you know, we were right around this area right here when the Russian-Ukraine war started here. We were out in the mid-95 dollar range. So there was a pretty big increase in 2021 uh, as we recovered from COVID. We oil went from basically $45 per barrel up to probably about 95 when the Russian-Ukraine war started. And then the oil jumped up really high, as you might expect, because, again, there was a lot of uncertainty about what was going to happen to the world supply or not. And this, this is probably a little bit of overreaction from traders for, for the start. You know, they weren't really weren't sure where to go and, and where to trade oil. So I kind, of, I kind of expected oil to kind of trade down a little bit lower price. And it did there for quite a bit of a longer time. It traded anywhere from this 100 to 110 to $15 range for a for several number of months. It kind of went up again when, uh, when the US economy started heating up in the spring of 2022. You remember back in April and May of that time that uh, gasoline prices here in the US got to about $5 a gallon here. Well, that kind of triggered a recession in the US. So our demand kind of went down really across the world. There's been recessions in some other countries. So oil prices really kind of went been uh, on a slow, steady retreat for the most part ever since then. So we went from about $120 per barrel and now we're at about $75 per barrel, much lower than what it was when the first conflict first started. Um, from my perspective, I think this price actually may be a little bit too low because I'm not sure traders have fully figured in the risk of something really bad happening in Russia, Ukraine, and not getting that oil out here. I think this price you're seeing right here, the $75, kind of assumes that we're going to keep getting the supply out of Russia that we currently are. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily a good assumption. To me, there's a lot more risk of prices going way high than there are prices going much lower than what we're seeing currently right now. And you can see what happened in the economy in Russia here. So about here was when this whole Russian-Ukraine war started. And surprisingly, you know, the ruble didn't actually collapse. Um, it actually strengthened during the early part of the war. Now, it has since then kind of bounced back 
to less than what, what it was weakened a little bit, but it's still probably stronger than what it was before the war started here. So, you know, Russia has done some things like requiring countries to buy oil in, in rubles that has really kind of helped the ruble actually not totally collapse like you first may have thought it was going to be. But Russia certainly faces some issues going forward. You know, they're trying to trying to fund a war. Um, they're certainly looking at fairly high inflation. Their interest rates have, uh, they're, they're, they're down a little bit, but they're still fairly high about seven and a half percent, but it is down from 20% from what it was last March. And inflation right now in the country is about 12 and a half percent here. So, you know, they're trying to fund a war effort where they're, we're still exporting the same amount of oil, but that oil price is much lower than what it was here. And again, that could be the key to actually maybe getting this thing stopped is Russia may run out of money just because they're not bringing in the oil revenue like they were before. Well, as you might expect, because the gas and diesel prices fully track with what's been happening in the oil market. So whenever oil prices start to decline, you're going to see the gas and diesel prices go down as well. So you see that kind of mirrored here in this graph, which looks very similar to what happened with the uh, oil market here. So we saw a big run up in um, fuel prices during most of 2021. The Russian Ukraine conflict started and we got prices up here. Uh, and then again, this is about May of last year where we had gas about $5 per gallon. And that, again, that's that's uh, kind of the question as economists we always ask is, does $5 gas fix $5 gas? Meaning that whenever gas gets that high, it really causes the country to kind of go into like at least a mini recession and slow down. That, that reduces demand and gas prices kind of go back the other direction. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Does, does high uh, fuel prices cause recessions or do recessions cause uh, fuel prices to go lower here. So I, we're seeing a case here where I think the price of gas actually contributed to probably uh, at least a small recession last summer, although there's some debate whether that was actually a recession or not, but it did meet the uh, textbook definition of two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. So we did have that going on. That, that kind of slowed down demand for oil, and we have seen uh, fuel prices go down. But what is maybe surprise you looking at this graph is notice what happened between the price of diesel versus the price of gasoline. Historically, there has always been about a 20 cent per gallon difference, at least for the last decade or so until the last year or so. Now that gap has gotten a lot wider. You can see it better on this next graph here where this is the diesel to gas premium here. So here's our kind of our historical norms of about 20 to 30 cent per gallon here. Um, Late last fall, that that had reached a peak of a dollar fifty per gallon. It's never ever been that high. So, think about what's happening if you're a farmer needing a lot of diesel fuel relative to the gas price. You're paying a lot higher diesel fuel price than you paid relative to the gas price ever before in your entire lives here. So this this is really concerning for those in small businesses, those in trucking, those in agriculture who need a lot of diesel fuel because you're paying more for diesel fuel than we would typically would have expected. Well, you might think, okay. Well, why haven't refineries made more diesel fuel? Well, you know, they do have some latitude to adjust the mix they make when they when they refine a barrel of oil. They can make maybe a little bit more diesel at the expense of gasoline and vice versa. Now, we're not really for sure exactly how much freedom they have. They still probably have to make a certain amount of gas, a certain amount of diesel fuel, and a certain amount of the other products. Um, even the EIA, the Energy Information Association, admits on their website that they don't really have good ideas or good data about exactly how much ability they do have. They know there's some ability, um, but it's not not total. They can't make all the all the barrel of oil into all these fuel. It's just, they got to make some gasoline in there, but they do have some capabilities to do that. Well, you're thinking this, this, this price incentive is so high to make diesel fuel. Why haven't we seen a more of a shift to making more diesel fuel at the expense of gas? Well, part of the answer is that both gas and diesel really are in short supply at the moment. It's just not diesel fuel that's kind of short. And I think the other question, and there's also this issue of refinery capacity I'll talk about here in a second, but there's also the issue then of, of who are you going to keep happy? So in the U.S., you know, we got 330 some million people, probably at least, you know, that many cars, if not more cars driving around in the U.S. versus the number of people who need to do diesel fuel. So if you keep the gas price high relative to what it has been, I think you're going to get more people complaining about things. And if you try to keep the consumers happy and maybe, you know, take off a few farmers and a few people on construction, that kind of thing. So that, that may be another, another reason. Again, I'm just doing a little speculating for why we haven't seen a bigger shift over to the diesel of fuel side of things. Well, based on uh, some regression analysis, looking about the last 10 years of oil prices and the relationship to what the fuel prices are, here, here's a regression line. It's a very strong 
regression loan. We get about a 90 to 95% correlation. At least we did until about the last six months to a year or so. So with oil currently at $75 per barrel, you would expect uh, gas prices and diesel price, prices to be here, which would translate to about 320 gas, about 350 diesel fuel with about 30% premium in there. Well, gasoline price nationally is probably not too far off from that, but we are certainly much, much higher than that on the, on the diesel fuel side of things. So the diesel fuel side of things has really set a new point over here. You can see some of the points in this area right here when fuel prices were real high, we kind of broke away from our traditional trend line. And that, that leads us to a question here. Are we ever going to get back where we follow this traditional trend line and, and refiners earn their traditional margins? Are we always going to be over in this category over here where we're away from, from what we were here where there's going to be a bigger margin in place? My answer would be, unless we get this refinery capacity issue fixed, if we ever can, again, that's a that's the kind of a uh, question that needs to be asked is, can we actually actually add more refinery capacity in the U.S.? I would say we're actually probably in a period where I may have to go back and start redoing these regressions based on more recent data here, because I think our, with our current situation, I don't I don't think these trend lines are going to hold going forward, at least at least in the immediate immediate future anyway. Now let's look a little bit of, look a, a little bit about that refinery capacity and utilization. So this is again some data from the EIA. Here's our capacity over here of, of how many barrels per day they can actually pr produce, and here's actually the utilization, which is you know how how hard are we using pushing these refineries? Well, looking at the utilization side, you can see we're using about ninety percent of our capacity to of what we have out there to actually produce fuel oil. And that's really pretty good because uh, think about our refinery system here in the US. Our last new refinery that was built in the US was built back in the 1970s. You know, there's so many, so many environmental hurdles to jump through these days that trying to get a new refinery built in the US is probably never ever going to happen. Our, our best hope is probably maybe to expand the refinery capacity we do have. The issue there is think about these things being built in the 70s. You know, these refineries are basically being held together with duct tape and bailing wire, maybe a little bit of chewing gum on the side here to keep these things operation. The fact that they can get 90 to 95 percent utilization to me is really simply amazing. Now, you saw what happened here when COVID hit. So here we were at the start of COVID. Demand for fuels really just dropped to the floor because we, you know, we couldn't go anyplace. So you can see what happened. We took refineries offline. Showing here the, the utilization of what we kept going dropped way down low. The trouble is a lot of this refinery capacity never did come back. We had some uh, that were closed permanently. And we, then we also had a refinery fire in Philadelphia that took that offline permanently. So we actually lost some refinery capacity that we, and it's never probably going to come back here. So to get back up here again, from where we are right here, we're going to have to expand our current production in our current facilities to kind of mass that. The other issue going on is if you're a refinery, uh, oil refinery company, and you're trying to produce oil, what incentives do you really have to add to capacity? I mean, there, there's that big premium you're seeing on the diesel fuel, so that's out there. But you, again, you have to go through and jump through all these hoops. The question they're asking is, well, how long is this demand going to be? Is it going to be a permanent demand, or is this just a temporary blip? You know, with this with this move to move to electrical vehicles, I would argue that it's, it's going to be a tougher sale to convince these companies to add refineries just because it's so expensive, so many hoops to jump through, and the long-term demand just may not be there if we make a quick transition to electric vehicles. Um, so again, uh, getting this fixed is gonna be a problem. So the fact that we're trying to add more oil to the US, like you know, we, we've been releasing oil from the strategic petroleum re reserves pretty heavily over this last year, that doesn't really solve our problem of prices because we can only produce so much oil uh, gas and diesel from that oil here. So we really need to work on the capacity side rather than maybe increasing the amount of oil that we have out there to actually refine in the first place. Here's a graph I took from the EIA, uh, some of the analysis they did. You can see um, their, their graph of the refinery capacity. It's really it, looking at this graph when you look at the entire range of production, it doesn't look like a whole lot. But again, this um, 2 million barrels per day, like you're seeing here, that, 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 that makes quite a difference when you're looking at trying to maintain supplies. And as a result, we have been short of fuels, particularly on the East and West Coast, when you look at the supplies of fuels there. That's why you probably read some of these horror stories about what the price of gas is in California, is because they are way or lower there than we are here in the Midwest. 
In fact, when you look at the five most recent five years, as far as the stocks of diesel fuel, what's been going on there, here is last year, 2022. Notice we were well below our typical norm for diesel fuel stocks the entire year here. In fact, you know, at one point, we were probably about 30, 30% lower than what we typically are here. That, that's a pretty, pretty good big reduction in our supply of diesel stocks here. And it's no wonder that we're paying such a big premium on the diesel fuel side is because your stocks are well are so low relative to what, what they would be. Unfortunately, when you look at the gas side, you know, it's better than what the diesel fuel side is, but it's still low too. We're still at a five-year low for most of the year for the gasoline side. So we're just kind of having a hard time catching up. Uh, the key to catching up actually could be the fact that maybe if we if we are looking at a recession and, uh, you know, we kind of had a mini one this last summer, but uh, looking at the surveys of economists, most economists, I believe, are expecting us to go into recession in the coming year here. That would actually actually help things on the fuel supply that would reduce demand that would give the refineries a chance to build back up some more of these stocks. And we could probably get that price differential between gas and diesel. Uh, lower than what it currently is. But if that doesn't happen, if the economy stays strong, then I would expect that price premium for diesel fuel to remain in place for quite a while. And it may take years, if ever, for that actually to get where we actually should be. All right, let's look at the IA projection. What they're looking at for fuel prices, I think this one just came out here not too long ago here. So there's, here's what they're thinking for gas and diesel prices. They're looking at probably a slow decline in prices over the next two years. Same for both gas and diesel. There's still a, there's still a gap here between that diesel and gas price that really is going to present, uh, persist for two years. It does get smaller than what it was right here, but it's still fairly large relative to what we see historically. Now, to me, I think they're being fairly optimistic for these prices to actually happen. They're, they're assuming, I think, that the current situation in Russia is not going to affect oil production coming out of Russia for these prices to maintain. Uh, my question with the Russia oil production, um, you know, they're able to get the oil out, but is Russia going to be looking at a situation that maybe happened similarly to what happened during the 1979 Iran situation with the Shah? You remember what happened there? Uh, the Shah was kind of forced to leave the country. At that point, when the Shah left the country, we actually had a lot of fighter planes in that country that we just left there. We couldn't get out in time. Well, Iran was never able to take advantage of those fighter jets because they didn't have the technology to ma maintain those. Apparently, someone was uh, thinking ahead there and they removed some very small part out of all those fighter jets. It was, wasn't hard to take off, but there was no way for Iran to, to regenerate that part. And they were stuck with a bunch of fighter planes that they could never get off the ground again because they were missing that one part. Is the same thing going to happen in Russia? I mean, I think the U.S. kind of helped Russia build up their oil industry. Uh, with us not being there anymore to kind of guide them and help them, or is Russia going to be able to maintain their current production, even if they can get it out? Do they have the skills and, and, and the technology to maintain what they currently have? I think that's an open question going forward. Well, what does the EIA think about oil? Um, this was probably, I think, probably a month before their, their most recent gas one came out. But it, this blue line was their projection for, for um, oil prices. You can see they saw show a slight increasing in price over the next year. I think they probably maybe have uh, modified that to have a slight downward decrease now. Here's what the futures markets were looking at. They were looking at a slow decline in prices. Again, they're kind of assuming the current situation holds here, but I do think the market has estimated this correctly because look at their confidence in a world well, with 95% confidence interval for prices. You can see it basically goes from $35 per barrel up to $185 per barrel here. And this really incorporates the risk, I think, that's present in the current wrestling situation that there really could be a, a, a fair chance, now that, I'm not going to say a good chance, but at least somewhat of a chance that uh, you know oil prices could explode if Russia suddenly became stopped being an exporter like they are now. You could easily see oil prices probably going anywhere from $150 to $200 if the, if the supply of oil from Russia was totally shut off. Again, here's my question about what happens with the GDP. Does that, does that cause high or low oil prices or is the other situation where the high gas prices cause a, a fall off in our economy? Well, here's, here's pre-COVID when the economy just came to a standstill. Here's kind of a rebound. And then we kind of saw small growth through most of 2021. Here's what happened when gas got up to $5 a gallon uh, last uh, April and May here. Notice what happened. That kind of put us into a mini recession. Again, there's some debate about whether this is a recession 
But again, from a textbook definition of two negative quarters of GDP growth, this was really a recession. We've kind of come back a little bit, but again, the economists are thinking going forward, at least the surveys of them say that, you know, we could be in another recession going forward, which would tend to keep uh, oil prices and gas prices lower if that actually happens. Or not. Well, what can farmers do with this whole situation? So again, uh, you know, we're seeing a big premium for diesel fuel, even though gas prices have kind of bounced back to more normal ranges here. But here, here's something farmers can look at when they're trying to price fuel for the year. Uh, this is based on the seasonality of the last five years. Again, COVID kind of messes this up a little bit, but it's still here. So the middle point is, is where the price of the fuel is relative to the price over the average of the rest of the year. You can see the situation that typically the highest times of the year to buy diesel fuel is gonna be during the spring planting season, April and May and June, where, get, where the diesel price is above average. The same thing with fall harvest, we see a premium for diesel fuel prices in. The best time to buy diesel fuel prices are in the summer here, like in August, where it's at least average or maybe a little bit below. But really January and February are the, probably the two best months historically for farmers to buy diesel fuel because you'll be paying probably about 30 cents, 40 cents less than you would be if you bought your fuel on an ad needed basis. So farmers who have the capability to store fuel, you know, now would be the time to buy diesel fuel because you will typically save on average lower than what you would be if you bought your fuel in um, April or May here. The same buy for the fall harvest. Buy your fuel then in August and you'll tend to pay probably, you know, 20 cents less than you would buying it at the fall harvest time here. So keep that in mind here. Storage can be beneficial for harvest and spring planting fuel prices. All right, let's uh, move over and look at the uh, fertilizer situation because really fertilizer and oil are pretty tied closely together here. So what happens in one market is going to affect the other one to a great uh, great deg degree here. So Russia is a major player in the fertilizer market. Not only do they produce a lot of it for their own use, but they're also one of the leading exporters in really all three major products here, NP and K. They're the number three producer of ammonia in the world. Uh, they're also one of the leader exporters in hydrogen or natural gas, which is used to make um, ammonia gas. So uh, they help a lot of other countries make their own ammonia by the fact that they're able to export natural gas. And really uh, that, that's the key to making nitrogen fertilizers for our countries. As long as you have natural gas, there's a process that was developed, I think it was like in World War I or II, this have a Bosch process where you basically burn natural gas and you actually pull the nitrogen out of the air. Not really the air is mostly nitrogen. So you're really making uh, ammonia gas really out of thin air through this process by the process of burning natural gas here. So as long as you have natural gas, you can make your own nitrogen fertilizer. You're not limited in that regard. U.S. is lucky we have a lot of natural gas so we can actually be self-supporting with uh, ammonia fertilizers and we actually are here. So we're not, we're not really constrained by what happens in Russia as far as the ability for us to make um, our own nitrogen fertilizers. Now, again, if, if Russia is unable to get uh, natural gas exported, then that's going to affect the natural gas price here, which could lead to higher fertilizer prices. So you got that going on as well here. Uh, the situation that does concern me more uh, from the uh, major nutrient on the fertilizer side is, is potash. We don't really produce any potash here in the U.S. We import all of our potash. Again, this is a mine product here. Russia accounts for 20% of world production, but when you combine uh, Belarus in there too, those two countries together, they really control about over a third of the world exports of uh, potash here. So they can have a great effect on the price there here. So you know, if that was suddenly cut off, expect to see much higher uh, world fertilizer prices there. The one good thing about P and K though, is this is a nutrient you don't necessarily have to apply every single year. You can, base, you can base your application based on what the soil tests are, and you can very easily carry over and skip a year if need be. Now, I'm not sure how many producers actually skip applying P and K last year because they were higher. They might have to apply some this year, but that is a, a nutrient that you can get by and, and base your application on what the actual soil test shows. So you may not need it in all regards here. So again, we're, we get most of our potash from Canada, but again, you know, Canada prices is not going to be excluded from what happens on the world price for potash here. So uh, if, if Russia potash, if they don't, if they, if they quit exporting and it causes the world price to go higher, we'll expect the Canadian price to be higher, which would make our price here in the US higher than as well. Um, Russia is also the one of the leader producers and exporters of phosphate rock, the phosphorus, the P side. 
Uh, they account for 6% of world production. Now we are, we do produce and mine most of our phosphate rock here in the US. Mosaic's one of our big producers for that here. So we do have access to that. Although it's getting harder and harder to mine that here in the US. We've kind of went through most of the good sources mined for that. So the stuff we are mining, even though we are pretty much self-sufficient, it's having to, it's coming from deeper and deeper places that are harder to get to. Mosaic, unfortunately, was they were successful in lobbying the government last year to impose tariffs on bringing in exported um, phosphate rocks. So that's one of the reasons why you're seeing that price higher here in the U.S. is we kind of have a tariff going on bringing in the phosphate rock here in the U.S. So I've developed basically a model to predict fertilizer prices based around these key components here. For the longest time, I based it just on the corn side and on the oil side, whereas corn was kind of my demand for uh, ammonia and the oil side was kind of a substitute for natural gas. And that was kind of my supply side. That model worked really good in the 20, until 2021 where it kind of went haywire. I went back and added in inflation expectations and that kind of fixed my model, at least temporarily here. I think that explains part of it. And now I have a model that actually works pretty well here. I have a couple of ag managers publications talking about this particular model here, but it does, it does work pretty well to predict in hydrous Fertilizer prices, uh, just have to know something about what the corn price is, what happened to the gold price in the past, and my expectation for inflation going forward. And here's my model, what it actually predicted uh, based on what I had in there for uh, oil prices and inflation and corn prices. I'm probably a bit high right now because I think I did plug in like $90 oil, about 9% uh, inflation and probably six to 650 corn in there. That's probably why my price is higher than what it actually currently is. So if, you know, if oil does stay around $80 per barrel and it looks like, you know, inflation may be on the, on the downside where it's, you know, it's like six and a half, I think the last, um, last reading that we had. So maybe this, this estimate's a little bit high here. And you're seeing that right now in the current anhydrous price. It has been drifting lower. It's still probably around $1,200, I think. Um, I expected to drift lower probably through the spring, at least until planting time. But I don't really think it's ever going to break through that $1,000 barrier. In fact, I would be really surprised if it got much below $1,100 before spring planting here. So we're kind of kind of stuck at this slowly drifting downward. To me, there's a lot of potential out there, potential risk out there that could make and hydrous go a lot higher if, if something would happen to the oil price and it would jump back up again. Then we could see a big jump all of a sudden in the uh, anhydrous price, kind of like we saw right here. So I, I wouldn't necessarily hold out if you were a farmer and haven't bought your fertilizer for this coming year with the idea of thinking it's gonna be lower. It may, it, again, it may drift lower to some degree, but I don't, I don't expect a big drop off in the anhydrous price before spring planting season rolls around. I think it's always gonna be probably above a thousand dollars for the next year or two going forward. Uh, there's some other, other things going on, you know, will a recession occur? You know, that that occurs certainly is going to affect oil prices, which is going to uh, probably help out fertilizer prices. And then we got some other things going on too, like, uh, you know, the, the, the pipeline from Russia to Europe for natural gas uh, was destroyed here. Uh, we don't know what the reasons for that was or why it happened, but certainly it removes a lot of the ability for Europe to actually make their own um, uh, nitrogen fertilizer that way. And then we also have some countries in the EU that are talking about removing farmland from production because of greenhouse gas issues. So we don't really know how that's going to play far. Still a lot of uncertainty going forward. And I think this next year will maybe tell a lot about how some of these things may actually play out or not. Um, so even though I only estimate the price of, of anhydrous, really all the fertilizers are pretty tied closely together. Even things like potash, which doesn't have any any uh, nitrogen in it, you know, DAF and MAP both have nitrogen as part of the component in it. So I, I would expect those to be highly correlated, but potash still, even though it has nothing to do with nitrogen, it still has a 0.79% correlation. A lot of that I think is tied to the fact that oil price is a big driver in hydrous. Well, oil price drives the ability for us to mine potash and uh, phosphate rock here. So that's, that's one of the reasons why you see those things being highly correlated is for the fuel price correlation, the fact it becomes much more expensive to mine those two fertilizers than it would otherwise. Well, how is all this going to affect farmers going forward? Well, if this, this is a percent of, gra uh, of expenses for our KFMA farm from the central, eastern, and western sides of the state here. So I have it as a graph view. I also have it as a chart view 
to look at basically 1978 versus 2021, you can see looking at this graph view that our biggest expense for farmers even today is still the machinery side. Now the machinery side includes not only the depreciation on buying the equipment, but it includes repair and maintenance and also includes fuel in that whole thing there as well here. So that's still our biggest expense on every farm across Kansas, but it has become less. Notice here machinery, at one point it was about in the Western part of the state, it was about 42% that has dropped off to about 30% or so. So it has dropped down a little bit. Machinery expenses though have been offset by the fact that we're paying much more for seed. It was at one time about six to 7% of our expenses. It's now about 12 to uh, 13%. And we're also paying more for herbicides too. It was about 2%. Now we're, now we're getting things done through a herbicide weed control as opposed to mechanical weed control. So those two things have offset the fact that less of our total percentages are on the machinery side. And again, the fact that uh, this is just the percent side, this next coming year coming up for farmers is going to be the most expensive they ever had if you're a row crop producer for getting a crop out. I think uh, you know a lot of our corn budgets now are looking at probably 600 per acre uh, expenses for putting a crop out here. It certainly has become a much more risky game for farmers these days because they do have to tie a lot more money up into the whole production side. And uh, speaking of tying money up here, notice here what's been happening to the interest rate. So this back in 1970s was when we had the first farm crisis and we were looking at double digit interest rates. That was a big expense category for practically every farm. When we're looking at anywhere from 12 to 13% of our total expenses being interest. Thanks to lower interest rates over the last decade or two, that percent that's gone toward interest with lower interest rates has become much less. It's only about three or 4% here. Uh, something for farmers to keep an eye on if we are looking at a period of higher inflation rate and raising interest rates to stop that inflation out, we could very easily see interest expense jump back up again. So for the longest time, that hasn't been a big factor for farmers. That very well could be again. That means your lender is going to become even more of your partner in agriculture, maybe than what you really want to have going forward than what they have been in the past, just because you're going to have to get an operating loan for a lot more money. But again, you're going to have to be paying a lot more to actually getting that money here. So this, this is something for farmers to keep in mind. Uh, we all know that fertilizer prices went up a lot during last year. They have since come back a little bit, but actually the category of expenses that has saw the biggest drop over the last 12 months have been herbicide costs. They have gone up 50% in the last year here. So, you know, we always hear this talk about fertilizer, but really farmers are paying a lot more for herbicides this next year than they ever have before too. Again, you know, 50% increase over what they paid in uh, 2022. So something to keep in mind, it's gonna be a very expensive year for farmers to put out a crop in the US. All right, I think that covers most of what I wanna talk about. So any questions, again, if you wanna follow me on Twitter, I have two accounts, uh, my Ivandall one, egg financing with the other one. I'm gonna try to limit my egg financing one just to talk about farm issues. My, my, my personal account, I tend to go into a range of topics, but if you just wanna focus on what's been happening on the egg side, then subscribe to me on egg financing. Greg, there's one in the chat. Uh, he says, is it possible that the recent drop in natural gas will ease the need for heating oil and make room for more diesel production before spring planting? Well, you know, actually for Europe, they, they worked out really well for them because they haven't had too, too severe of a winter. They actually filled up a lot of their natural gas uh, storage facilities before the winter started here. So they kind of got through the winter here so far anyway, with the fact that even though they kind of got cut off from their natural gas out of Russia, that they were still able to have a good supply and, and not be affected too bad here. Yeah, I think the fact that really, you know, the winter really hasn't been all that bad cold wise, I, I think that maybe can help the fact that we can maybe devote more natural gas for fertilizer use instead of using it for other uses that we might typically use for heating and such and maybe generating power here. So yeah, that's that would certainly help the farmers on the, on the fertilizer side going forward. I should mention in mind too, you know, the fertilizer industry has consolidated a lot over the last couple of years, not near as competitive as what it used to. I think that may be another factor you're seeing why fertilizer prices maybe jumped up so much is that the amount of competition among fertilizer suppliers has gotten less over the last four or five years. Here's one. Uh, we use natural gas to irrigate. Does the recent natural gas price drop represent a good opportunity to hedge for this summer? Should I consider hedging multiple years? Oh, good question. Uh, you know, again, I, I think there's a, a chance prices are going to keep drifting lower. The question is how much lower. 
to me, the risk, really risk is there could be a potential for a gigantic increase in prices too, like we saw what happened with fuel prices in 2021 here. So to me, the, the, the upside for having high risk High prices in the in the future could be could be pretty extreme if some of those situations do play out. Whereas your chances of things going much lower, I think, are smaller here. So yeah, I wouldn't be afraid to go ahead and and you know book some and hit some ahead of time if you can you know kind of lock in the current price. Anything else, folks? You know, Antonina, I just realized there was one that came in uh, as Greg was starting, and I'd forgotten about it. Um, he asked, would the 22% that you noted, would that hold for the spring planting? So will spring planting be 22% less land area? No, no, no. 22% that is our arable land that is out uh, of use now. Uh, um, the uh, spring crops will be uh, lower. Actually, in Ukraine, we mostly plant winter crops rather due to our uh, climate. Uh, we already uh, planted uh, a lot of winter crops, right? So like we plan to have eight uh, and a half, uh, maybe million hectare of winter crops. So, uh, the, our total arable land before the war, it was 28.4 million hectares. And now we have 24.6 million hectares under our control. And minus 3.8, that is under our control, but we cannot plant. So that was about arable land, not about crops. But our crops uh, in general will be up to 45% less than in previous year. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> 